Well, it's uh, good to be here. Um, I'm Dr. Mike Trexler from Kalamazoo. And due to time, I'll just launch into our, uh, it's actually our fourth session on pain management, but this is specifically going to be focusing on uh, pain assessment and management in hospitalized patients, especially managing selected opioid side effects and how to safely, effectively, and appropriately prescribe opioids in special situations, including end of life. Um, we'll focus on hospitalized patients who, uh, with altered mental status, refractory pain, adjunctive medications, opioid side effects, and opioid metabolism issues. Some of this will be review uh, from prior lectures, but that's because it's important to know. Uh, I'd like to start with a case of a man with COPD, lung cancer, and chronic low back pain. Uh, due to degenerative disease as well as bone mets. He's on MS Contin and Percocet. Both were held on admission to the ICU as he had um, some altered mental status, severe dyspnea, fever, cough, and encephalopathy. He was given the usual medical management. He was noted to be tachycardic, tachypnic, um, borderline hypoxic, lethargic, uncomfortable, restless, and painful. He was placed on BiPAP and palliative medicine was consulted for symptom management and goals. So pain in hospitalized patients is very common, especially in the ICU, more than half of patients in the ICU or at end of life. There are many causes, medical illnesses like ischemia, inflammation, infection, pancreatitis is terribly painful. Uh, we have a patient on our service who's been in the hospital over a month and he's just had horrible uh, pain. Um, when patients are NPO, as they often are, because of procedures or because of altered mental status or dysphagia, uh, pain meds are held. And then their pain spirals out of control. Uh, there are also procedures, phlebotomy, IV, central lines, tubes, trauma or post-op patients uh, or pre-existing chronic pain. And then the concept of total pain, which was referred to in prior lectures, but just to reiterate it because you'll see it on the boards, um, total pain refers to the physical, psychosocial and emotional and spiritual components uh, that affect pain perception and pain levels. Um, oftentimes pain has effect on function, relationships, sleep, especially in the hospital, mood, quality of life, and enjoyment of life. And there are many stressors or contributors, um, such as uh, poor sleep or fatigue, fear, anxiety, denial of the illness, anger, for whatever reason, you know, whether it's people not answering their call lights or just upset about being in the hospital, depression and loneliness in the hospital, financial stressors, loss of faith or meaning and spiritual distress. And then you can think of it like the volume knob. Uh, many times when you walk into the room, the patients, you know, they look, when you walk in, they start moaning and groaning and acting really painful. Then you sit down and you have a conversation with them. And after a few minutes, you notice, oh, they look pretty comfortable. They'll still say they're in pain. Um, and when difficult topics come up, all of a sudden their pain spirals out of control. And you start asking about their home supports or social situation or sources of stress. And all of a sudden, oh, you know, oh, it hurts. I need something now. Um, it doesn't mean the pain isn't real. It just means that it's like turning up or turning down the volume. And when you get them distracted, oftentimes the volume gets turned down. So pain also has adverse effects on hospitalized patients. There's an increased stress response, uh, which affects the immune function. Uh, there's Because of decreased movement related to pain, people become more debilitated. They may not eat as much. Um, their function declines. They may have anxiety and fear, sleep deprivation, risk of developing chronic pain and PTSD. Prolonged time on mechanical ventilation has been associated with under treatment of pain. Patient and family stress um, is also a result of un undertreated pain. And then, of course, the infamous satisfaction surveys. Um, and then increased mortality risk, believe it or not. Pain is a more terrible lord of mankind than even death itself. There are people who say, I would rather die than be in this much pain. Uh, and then when you get their pain controlled, suddenly, oh yeah, I, I would want to continue medical treatment. I'm not ready for hospice yet. So let's talk about some pain assessment tools, specifically focusing on hospitalized patients who may have impaired reporting, but 
if they can talk to you, then uh, taking the time to listen empathetically to try to understand the context of this illness and where their you know what their pain has been like in the past, uh, establish trust, focus on the whole patient, and determine the impact of the pain on quality of life and function. What is it that they can't do because of the pain? And what would they like to do? Obviously, a comprehensive H and P uh, patient self-report, intensity and characteristics recognizing that there is variability among individuals. And people who look comfortable doesn't necessarily mean they don't have pain. Uh, they may say it's eight out of 10, uh, eight to 10 out of 10. That's pretty common in people with chronic pain to look comfortable, but yet say their pain level is really high. And then establish an accurate diagnosis. What's the, the reason for the pain? What's been done before to, to um, elaborate the cause and understanding the comorbidities? What treatments have been tried and are they effective or not? Uh, are there any coexisting psychiatric conditions or history of abuse or trauma which place people at increased risk of the uh, psychosocial and spiritual pain? You can throw all the opioids in the world at someone with psychosocial and spiritual pain and not get their pain under control. And then, uh, do they have any current or past substance abuse? And again, this factors into their, their risk of opioid use disorder. So when patients are critically ill or seriously ill in the hospital, a lot of times they can't tell you what their pain is like. Um, they may be getting sedative meds or be encephalopathic. They may be on the ventilator. So oftentimes we rely on family and staff perception of pain and suffering. And we look at vital signs, we look at behavioral signs, and there are some objective tools that we can use. Uh, the behavioral pain scale is one such tool. It's for intubated patients. Uh, looks at three domains with one to four scale in each domain, and it is valid and reliable. So specifically looking at facial expression, upper limb movements, and compliance with ventilation. Um, the CPOT also is scored zero to eight, also looks at facial expression, body movements, muscle tension, compliance with the ventilator. It's valid and reliable. And I bring these tools up because a lot of these are actually embedded in the EMR. Um, in our ICU, we, um, well, in our hospital, we use Cerner. The CPOT is part of the ICU nursing assessment. That's one of the tools that they can use. So they might uh, use that to describe someone's pain based on the CPOT. Um, however, just because somebody isn't moving doesn't mean they're not in pain. Uh, they may have sedatives on board, or they may just be so weak uh, that they're not moving much. Or on the other hand, agitation or hypoxia may influence ventilator compliance. It doesn't necessarily mean pain. Restlessness is nonspecific, and there's no way to really measure anxiety or fear, which may magnify pain. And neither the BPS nor CPOT have been evaluated for response to analgesics. So another score that you may have come across is the pain AD score. The nice thing about this is that it's it's quantifiable pain measure in those unable to communicate, um, and it's scored zero to 10, as opposed to zero to eight. And five areas, breathing, negative vocalization, facial expression, body language, and consolability. Each one is scored zero to two, with zero being normal, two being severe, um, severe symptoms. And it's something you can follow over time to see, to actually measure the effect of the analgesics. Um, so remember uh, just some, uh, remember just having a balanced approach, understanding the limitations of pain assessment uh, and what things can be misinterpreted as pain or not. And then consider non-pain discomfort like GI or GU issues. Family impressions are generally very helpful because they know the patients and they know when they think they would be in pain. Or maybe some people have really high pain tolerance, others have very low pain tolerance. I uh, had one uh, lady say, well, my husband would go, he would go to the ER for a hangnail. You know, he just doesn't tolerate pain well at all. Um, and so that was helpful to know, you know, understanding that we needed to be more aggressive with his pain control. Um, so basically, you individualize it based on the patient pain risk profile and your clinical suspicion of whether or not they would have pain. Uh, and when in doubt, perform an empiric analgesic trial and monitor for effects. You know, does blood pressure improve? Do the, does the breathing rate come down from mid-20s down to, you know, high teens or something like that? So let's talk about 
patients with refractory pain, um, a lot of times people fear, you know, feeding the, you know, the fear of addiction. And so they just are more hesitant to give opioids or other medications, um, or they don't want to cloud the exam. Um, so this case is a man with stage four esophageal cancer who has a PEG tube. He uh, has debility, 20 pound weight loss, cachexia, and worsening pain control despite escalating opioids, specifically fentanyl patch, which is now 200 micrograms um, over the past three months. And he's asking for pain medications every two to four hours. Um, he was admitted to the hospital with intractable pain, dyspnea, and anxiety. He looked very distressed and uncomfortable. He was breathing 30 times a minute. Um, interestingly, his lungs were clear. Uh, his albumin was two and his BMI was 17. So why is his pain out of control and how can we help? So any of the fellows want to take a stab? <clears throat> Go ahead. He doesn't have enough sub-Q, uh, subcutaneous fat. Absolutely. Yep, you got it. Um, so when somebody has uncontrolled pain, despite high opioid doses, you got to ask yourself, well, what else is going on? You know, there must be something. So is it is it an acute illness? Is there infection, inflammation, ischemia, which is beyond their baseline level of pain control? Something new, in other words? Is there disease progression of the cancer? Is there poor opioid absorption, uh, either through the gut or through the skin? Uh, opioid metabolism may be mod or may be uh, affected uh, due to genetic polymorphisms. Um, pain type not responsive to opioids. Uh, for instance, you know, is it a more of a neuropathic pain than a somatic pain? Um, are there emotional, psychological, or spiritual issues which are magnifying the pain? Has the patient developed tolerance, withdrawal, or hyperalgesia? And is there pseudo addiction versus opioid use disorder? Um, particularly with cancer, we think about progression of the disease or destruction of surrounding tissue, or have they developed increased intracranial pressure, bony metastases, abdominal organ compression or obstruction, or nerve impingement or invasion? These are all things to think about when you're uh, evaluating the patient and figuring out the best way to treat. So fentanyl patches become poorly absorbed if there's weight loss, cachexia, and decreased adipose tissue. Also, uh, you know, if, they're, if they have a low albumin or low BMI, that's a um, certainly a, a warning flag that they may not absorb the fentanyl patch very well. So this often happens in cancer patients. As the disease progresses, the appetite goes down, they lose weight, they become cachectic, less adipose, less medication absorption, lower bioavailability, and reduced efficacy. Um, also, to consider people on chronic opioids do develop uh, physiologic um, tolerance due to upregulated mu receptors. Um, there's also physical dependence, which is seen in everybody on chronic opioids. In other words, if you stop the medicine abruptly, they will go into withdrawal. It doesn't mean they're addicted or have a substance use disorder, which reflects more the psychological uh, components. Um, or if you give an antagonist, it'll put them in withdrawal. But that's just because that's what their body is used to. Um, addiction, which there's a separate lecture, a whole lecture on addiction, so I'm not going to spend too much time here, but just know that it's um, it's chronic, it's genetic, there's lots of factors, it's continued use despite harm, impaired control over use, and preoccupation with use, uh, generally for non-pain purposes, like to get high, so cravings, uh, and it worsens with opioid, as the opioid dose goes up, it worsens like pouring fuel on the fire. Pseudo addiction, on the other hand, is where you have somebody whose behaviors are misinterpreted as drug seeking, uh, such as moaning, clock watching, repeated requests for medication, telling you the pain is 12 out of 10. Um, patient complaints appear excessive to the given stimulus. Um, if the symptoms improve and the behaviors improve with increasing analgesic treatment, then this is what we would term pseudo addiction. Uh, which means that their pain is basically undertreated, and once it's fully treated, then they're able to function and have better quality of life. Um, for treating refractory pain, obviously there are 
are many options, including opioids, but um, there's adjuvant medications, non-pharmacologic measures, NMDA blockers, and interventional procedures. A number of these have already been touched on in other lectures or will be touched on during the year, so I will just mention them briefly. Um, so non-pharmacologic options like PT, OT, um, just getting people out of bed, moving around, heat, ice, behavioral, especially I found the distraction techniques very useful, especially in helping people cope uh, with pain. So environmental distractions, television, music, uh, social interactions, uh, physical distractions, such as taking a soft bristle brush and gently stroking the skin, having the patient do that, and because um, that will send competing signals to the brain to distract their brain. Uh, meditation, prayer, guided imagery, cognitive behavioral therapies, and then psychosocial and spiritual support as well. And then just listening to the patient often is therapeutic. Um, adjuvant medications, uh, again, we've touched on a lot of these during the course of our previous lectures, so I'll just mention them briefly. Um, acetaminophen, uh, very often, especially if somebody has ongoing pain, uh, it, it's, um, you know, more and more we're seeing, uh, you know, putting people on scheduled acetaminophen just to try to spare the opioids that they might need and uh, preserve mental status. Um, also, of course, you know, watching out for the total daily dose or risk of liver toxicity. Uh, NSAIDs, if there's an inflammatory component and if they don't have contraindications or risks like uh, GI risks, uh, liver failure, renal failure, cardiac risks, um, steroids. And this is a very important medicine category to keep in mind with cancer. Um, there are certain indications specifically for steroids where this works perhaps even more effectively than opioids. So spinal cord compression causing back pain due to metastatic disease, um, or just, or even without spinal cord compression, um, helps with inflammation, also helps with the pain. Increased intracranial pressure and cerebral edema causing headache responds very well to steroids. Um, and then of course, radiation therapy, malignant bowel obstruction, lymphangitis carcinomatosis and SBC obstruction. And this also may help with cancer-related pain, anorexia, nausea, and inflammation such as gout if NSAIDs are contraindicated because of renal failure, for example. Um, obviously there are side effects of steroids, uh, hyperglycemia, Insomnia, mood swings, depression, fluid retention, impaired immunity, or risk of infection, and then long-term risk of GI side effects like gastritis, ulcers, bleeding, skin thinning, cataracts, osteoporosis, and avascular necrosis. Uh, generally, dexamethasone uh, is preferred because it's, um, it doesn't have the mineral corticoid effects, um, and generally a low dose. And because it's long-acting, you can dose it twice a day. They're generally a shorter duration, and you don't have to taper it if they're just on it for a few days. Uh, obviously, if they have something uh, life or limb threatening like spinal cord compression, you would use a higher dose and likely give it IV perhaps even every six hours rather than twice a day. Um, TCAs, again, this is review, so but you you will see these things on the boards. Uh, just know that these are tools in your toolbox. And sometimes you have to treat pain using multiple angles, multiple pathways, because the pain is refractory to just one medication. Um, so TCAs or tricyclic antidepressants, helpful for neuropathic pain, but obviously they can uh, have some side effects like QT prolongation and cardiac dysrhythmias, urinary retention, orthostatic hypotension, especially in the elderly, dry mouth and dizziness, Anti-epileptic drugs are also for neuropathic pain, um, but they can cause sedation, dizziness, blurred vision, skin reactions, and they most of them are renally excreted, so uh, reducing the dose if the GFR is less than 30. Uh, so examples, uh, gabapentin, pregabalin. I usually start the gabapentin low and at bedtime because uh, sedation or fatigue are that's the most common side effect, and then gradually increase it to TID dosing. Um, again, renal failure patients, you would want to limit the dose of this. Uh, trigeminal neuralgia has been treated with oxcarbazepine and carbamazepine. 
uh, there is a risk of serious skin reactions. And so they recommend screening for that HLA allele first, and also risk of aplastic anemia or agranulocytosis. So we don't use these medicines lightly or frequently. We usually try other things first. Uh, the SNRIs are also helpful, especially uh, if there's neuropathic pain, central pain, or somatic pain. If they have hypertension or risk of serotonin syndrome with other drugs, uh, for instance, tramadol um, is a risk factor with the SNRIs and SSRIs. Um, so venlafaxine and duloxetine are the most commonly used, especially duloxetine. Topical medications like lidocaine patch. Uh, it's useful if the pain is very localized and superficial, and also if there's a neuropathic component. Uh, generally, you apply the patch daily, 12 hours on, 12 hours off, to prevent the person from becoming used to the med so it doesn't work anymore. Um, side effects um, or risks, seizures, um, heart block, bradycardia, tinnitus, or hypotension, and avoid in severe renal or hepatic impairment. And uh, some of these were mentioned in the previous lectures as well. So I'll just mention them briefly. Clonidine, opioid sparing effect, anxiolytic, um, multiple routes of administration, and uh, sites of action. Uh, monitor for hypertension and bradycardia. Uh, and then lidocaine and maxillotine. Again, uh, those are more useful for phantom limb pains, burns, uh, but they do have risk of cardiac conduction abnormalities. And then de dexmedetomidine was mentioned last week. Uh, interventional options. And again, there is a, another lecture on this during the year, so I'll just mention this briefly. So nerve blocks, pain pumps, surgery, or radiation. Just things to think about if you're dealing with refractory pain and the medicines just aren't enough to keep things under control. Uh, keep these options in mind. Okay, so let's bring out the big guns. Talk about opioids. Um, so we would use them when the non-opioids have failed to improve function or quality of life enough. And if there's malignant pain, moderate to severe, especially near end of life, uh, in moderate to severe non-malignant pain, if the pain is, is acute and severe and the benefits outweigh the burdens or risks. Um, chronic pain, if it's uncontrolled by less potent medications or non-opioids, um, and again, weighing the risks versus the uh, benefits, and if you're not suspecting abuse, uh, abuse diversion or OUD. So if someone isn't on opioids, then you could add opioids. If they're already on opioids, then you could increase the dose. You could change the frequency, uh, change the opioid, change the route of administration. For instance, topical to oral. Um, in severe instances, you can use a continuous IV infusion or PCA pump. And then if you suspect a neuropathic component or severe ongoing pain, uh, then consideration of NMDA blockers. We've got separate lectures this year on methadone and on ketamine. Um, others include, other NMDA blockers, believe it or not, include memantadine or, um, or nemenda, uh, dextromethorphan or DM, uh, is also an NMDA blocker. It's over the counter. Um, so it's, it could be something that somebody could try if needed. When you're giving Opioids, it's important to remember how quickly they work so you can assess the patient for effectiveness and also dose them appropriately. So what you don't want to do is dose IV morphine, PRN, Q, 12 hours, because obviously it's going to wear off a long time before that. Um, if someone's at risk for severe pain and breakthrough pain, you're not going to want to dose it even every four hours because the IV dose may wear off before then. Um, so with IV doses, you can begin to see an effect within 2 to 15 minutes. So if by 15 to 30 minutes, if they're still miserable or still looking very uncomfortable, you can dose them again. Um, the medicine may last one to three hours. Um, of note is that dilaudid or hydromorphone has a longer half-life, and so I would not recommend dosing that one every 15 to 30 minutes because it will dose stack, and then two hours later, the patient might become apneic. So morphine and fentanyl don't tend to do that as much. 
Orally, obviously, the onset is later, so 15 to 30 minutes, peak effect 60 to 90 minutes, duration two to six hours. Uh, you've seen this table in prior lectures, just a quick review. Um, and I can send the slides uh, to Susan so she can send them out if needed. And you probably are, already have this anyway, but I just know the different potencies of the medications. Um, so just to just by way of review, so IV morphine, one milligram IV is like three milligrams orally or two and a half to three, depending on which table you use. Oral morphine and oral hydrocodone are the same. Oxycodone is one and a half times as potent as hydrocodone or morphine. Um, the 25 microgram fentanyl is the same as one milligram of IV morphine. Um, hydromorphone, roughly one milligram IV equals four milligrams orally, or one milligram IV equals about 10, maybe as much as 15 milligrams of oral morphine. Um, and then orally, it's about a one to four, one to five conversion ratio. Uh, as was mentioned last week, uh, if somebody's in a pain crisis, you can dose titrate to effect. You can dose IV every 15 to 30 minutes until they're comfortable. And then uh, each day you can determine how much you need to increase their dose to get them comfortable based on the severity of their pain. And really the only ceiling dose is that which causes excessive sedation or respiratory depression. But I'll, I'll tell you that when patients have been in pain for days and they finally get pain relief, they often sleep. The key to knowing if they're over-medicated is can you wake them up and can they converse with you when they're awake or are they you know, so somnolent that they're just lethargic and nothing will wake them up. <clears throat> so if you can wake them up and talk to them, then they're not over-medicated, they're just catching up on sleep. Um, just again, to mention this briefly, I know it was covered last week, but it's such an important topic that I just wanted to reinforce some points. So IV opioid infusions are for ongoing severe pain or dyspnea, despite frequent IV boluses. In other words, they're needing doses at least every two to four hours. Uh, benefits, faster uniform pain control, safer and better tolerated, less sedation and less hypotension because you're spreading that dose out over an hour rather than giving it all at once. Um, so also less risk of respiratory depression and generally greater patient satisfaction. And remember, uh, the IV boluses are used to achieve pain control, whereas the IV drips are to maintain patient or pain control. Um, one of the biggest pitfalls I've seen, especially among um, nursing staff, is somebody looks uncomfortable and they're on a morphine drip and the nurse uh, just turns the drip up thinking that that will get their pain under control, which it may eventually, but it'll take at least an hour or two for that increased dose to really re reach the patient and take effect. So always bowl. If somebody's uncomfortable right now, bowl them. And then if, they, if you need to adjust the drip rate, you can do that later. But again, it takes, uh, you know, it takes a while. It takes really up to six to eight hours to see the full effects of the drip. So you don't want to be titrating that rapidly. You want to use the boluses instead. Um, just also, it's helpful to consider the different potencies. So morphine, fentanyl, or hydromorphone are the three major drugs that we use for opioid infusions. And I've listed equivalent dosing ranges. So one to four milligrams of IV morphine is the same as 25 to 100 micrograms of fentanyl, which is the same as 0.25 to one milligrams of hydromorphone. <clears throat> and obviously you're going to consider the patient factors like how tolerant or naive are they to opioids? What's their prior usage? What is their current need? And then do they have any organ failures that would affect metabolism? Specifically in renal failure, morphine is renally cleared. So uh, if depending on how bad the renal failure is, you may want to use fentanyl rather than morphine. So the metabolite um, doesn't build up. One of the signs of the metabolite building up with morphine is myoclonus. So if somebody's starting to get a bit twitchy uh, and they're on morphine, uh, consider switching to a different opioid or reducing the dose. Okay, so, um, and again, this is review, um, but just in terms of the dose and calculate the acrianalgesic dose or the morphine milligram equivalents of currently used opioids, 
divide by the hourly rate um, or divide by the time that that medicine has been given in in hours, and that gives you the hourly rate. And then tweak it up or down depending on the anticipated need. You usually start with an initial bolus to get them comfortable and then starting the drip to maintain the comfort and you can bolus every 15 to 30 minutes and obviously monitoring for respiratory rate and comfort. Um, and if you need to titrate it, always bolus first. But again, don't adjust the drip rate very often because it takes up to eight hours to achieve steady state. If you're really concerned about um, respiratory rate and respiratory status, then, and it's a, just a plain a good idea to monitor their breathing rate anyway when they're on an infusion. Um, considering continuous pulse ox if they're a CO2 retainer, and then targeting the respiratory rate to less than 24 on labored, and then holding it if the respiratory rates gets down to eight to 10 or if they're unarousable unless they're actively dying and it's comfort care. And then once they are controlled, then you wanna figure what's, what's your exit strategy? How are you going to get them off the drip? Because they obviously can't go home on the drip uh, most of the time. Um, so when the symptoms are controlled, then you can begin a long acting opioid if they're going to need something ongoing you know, over the next days to weeks. And then, then you can begin tapering about every four hours um, once the long-acting opioid begins to take effect and then weaning down is tolerated over the next 12 to 24 hours or stop the infusion if it's already at a minimal rate. I want to spend a little bit of time now talking about side effects, specifically constipation. And you are definitely going to see this on the boards. They always want you to be aware if you're going to prescribe opioids, you've got to make sure that you're addressing bowel function, monitoring when their last bowel movement was, and making sure that they're on something to not only prevent OIC, but also treat it. Um, actually, constipation is one of the biggest fears that patients have about opioids, besides addiction. Um, you know, they don't want to become addicted, and they don't want to become constipated. And so, and this is the one side effect where no tolerance develops. Um, it's rare that you have somebody who never becomes constipated on opioids, but uh, no matter how long you're on it, you, you're always gonna need to be concerned about this. Um, complications, you know, if somebody does get constipated, they're gonna have a decreased appetite and oral intake. They may develop reflux, nausea, vomiting, and aspiration fits bowel obstruction in severe instances, and uh, even bowel perforation, sepsis, and death. Uh, mechanisms, uh, it's the mu opioid receptors on the intestinal cells and the enteric neurons, which suppresses forward peristalsis, incre increases fluid reabsorption, which makes the stool more hard, reduces intestinal secretions, and increases the sphincter tone. So to prevent this, we encourage adequate hydration and activity. And if somebody is able to drink enough fluids, then fiber would be useful. And even simple things like prunes or prune juice can be helpful. Uh, not everybody likes that, but it's cheap and it's, it is effective. A uh, maintenance laxative regimen, ideally having a bowel movement every one to two days. Now, some people say that they never have bowel movements that often. Um, but again, it, the longer someone goes without a bowel movement, the harder it will be to pass the stool, the more uncomfortable it will be, and the more risk of complications. So ideally, a bowel stimulant is the best prophylaxis. So Senna or Bisicodal are, are good examples um, because that helps counteract the slowing effect on the gut of the opioids. And then escalate the laxatives every one to two days as needed. There are different types of laxatives. So osmotic laxatives are another option, and these can be given along with. Uh, so you may start with a stimulant laxative, and then two days later add an osmotic laxative, uh, such as, um, well, if they've got liver disease, lactulose is a good choice, uh, but you can also use polyethylene glycol, which is Miralax, um, glycerin, magnesium salts, and sorbitol. Uh, but if someone has renal failure, heart failure, or liver failure, you want to avoid the magnesium or phosphate-based uh, laxatives. Um, mineral oil or peanut oil can cause uh, malabsorption. 
Um, and the, so these lubricant laxatives, I, although they work, um, they do have some potentially serious side effects. Uh, skin irritation, the worst one would be a lipoid aspiration pneumonia. So avoid giving oral mineral oil. Um, and then um, because it increases, or because docosate increases mineral oil absorption, uh, generally they don't recommend giving the lubricant within two hours of docosate. Suppositories are kind of the next line after the oral. You know, if the oral is not enough, then consider not only treating from above, but treating from below. So bisacodal suppository usually works within an hour. Glycerin suppository within 30 minutes. Uh, you can use enemas. Uh, again, you'd want to do that as a last resort because they're uncomfortable for patients. Um, avoid in renal disease, avoid the sodium phosphate enema in renal disease because of the phosphate content and uh, the risk of AKI. Uh, you can do warm tap water enemas, soap suds enema, oil retention, milk and molasses enemas. Again, these sound very messy. Uh, so, you know, your nursing staff and your patients may not appreciate this. So it's far better to try to prevent it if you can. And then you can also use prokinetic agents. Um, obviously, you'd want to make sure that they're that they don't have fecal impaction or bowel obstruction before you start to increase the, the push from above. Um, so metoclopramide is an old drug. Um, it does work. Uh, it can increase QT prolongation or people put people at risk for um, the extra pyramidal side effects. Um, so just be careful with it, especially if they're already on medicines that could increase QT prolongation. Cholinergic agents like neostigmine or colchicine. Again, these are used as a last resort. You know, one of the side effects of colchicine is diarrhea. So that's why it made the list for this. Um, refractory OIC, uh, there's also the option of a peripherally acting mu opioid antagonist, um, methyl naltrexone. Because it's methylated, it doesn't uh, you know, it kind of stays peripheral. It doesn't affect the central uh, nervous system processing of um, analgesia. So it doesn't affect analgesia. It just uh, kind of unlocks the gut. Oftentimes, people just need a one-time injection sub-Q. It's based on weight. Response is usually within four hours, and it does not cause opioid withdrawal. And then there's some other things that we can use. Um, so oral naloxone or naltrexone. Uh, naloxigol, um, per the FDA, it's for non-cancer pain. Uh, lubiprostone, um, naloxone with oxycodone. Um, for post-op ileus, alvimapan is another option. And then agents that improve colonic transit time. So probiotics, metoclopramide, which you mentioned already, uh, linaclotide, which affects calcium channels, and then citalopram which is not FDA approved for OIC, but one of the side effects is diarrhea. So that's why it made the list. So if somebody has depression and they're constipated, this might be a good choice. All right. Um, so you have an, an older obese man with COPD and chronic pain who's on long acting morphine three times a day became somnolent after being outside all day in the July heat. This is a real case. Uh, respiratory was six, SATs were 87%. He had myoclonus. Uh, he got intubated uh, to, because of, he was in, um, it was an emergency, uh, but then was able to be extubated pretty quickly. 59-year-old um, woman with chronic cancer pain was given four milligrams of IV morphine by the nurse for severe breakthrough pain. 15 minutes later, she was somnolent, but arousable, a respiratory rate of eight, O2 sat 91%. So what should you do? And this is something that is important to know and something that I have yet to have anybody, any, any resident has not told me that this is something that they've learned about. And they're the ones that are usually covering the hospital wards at night. So it's important to know this. So should you, A, immediately give naloxone 0.4 milligrams, that's an amp of Narcan, B, give naloxone 0.04 milligrams, or C, provide oxygen, monitor the patient, and wait for the opioid effects to wear off. Uh, so what about the first gentleman? What would you do there? 
Would you give him the full dose of Narcan, give him a tenth of the dose? Would you just provide supportive care? Or the second, the second lady, I think, I think she could probably get option C. Uh, she's not in as extreme distress. So who thinks that you should give a full amp of Narcan? How about uh, the tenth of the amp? How many of you would, would do that? Anyone? You guys are a quiet bunch. All right, well, let's talk about this. So is this a near miss? Yeah, probably, at least in the first case. Um, but it's something that wasn't intended by the providers, obviously. So respiratory depression um, is rare, but it's also the most feared adverse effect on, on the part of providers. And people do develop a tolerance to it. So the longer someone's on opioids, the less likely they are to develop it, but not impossible. So risk factors, cardiopulmonary disease, especially if they're a CO2 retainer, upper respiratory infections, and very important, the FDA recommends for safe opioid prescribing. They recommend when somebody comes into the hospital with a pneumonia, they recommend reducing the opioid doses by 25 to 50%. Um, reducing their chronic opioid doses because of the risk of respiratory failure. Um, if they have new or worsening kidney or liver disease, obviously this uh, should be a, um, an indication for dose reduction because the metabolism and clearance is going to be reduced. Um, concurrent sedative use, such as benzodiazepines or alcohol, uh, advanced age or prior hypoxic response, or opioid naive patients requiring frequent, large, or rapidly escalating doses, such as post op or trauma patients. And then rapid dose increases of long acting opioids, especially if you increase them more rapidly than the pharmacology would allow for. So, how do you treat respiratory depression? Obviously, you hold the opioids temporarily and remind the patient to breathe if they're conscious. Obviously, if they're not, or if it's life-threatening, uh, then you have to treat them emergently. So the question is, can you get away with treating them medically, or do you immediately have to intubate them? So uh, you can give naloxone, which actually would be recommended if it's life-threatening. I would recommend giving that up front, but the dose range is different than the traditional AMP of Narcan. So 0.04 to 0.1 milligram, which is one tenth to one quarter of an amp, uh, will avoid completely blocking the analgesic effects and avoid precipitating opioid withdrawal. And if you need to repeat it, you can do that. You can even put them on a drip and put them in the ICU for close monitoring, uh, which is fine. You, doing this might actually avoid them having to be intubated. Uh, but it's very important to know this, that low doses of naloxone will help reverse respiratory depression without reversing analgesic effect. On the other hand, if you give them a full amp and they wake up, they're going to be in terrible pain and there's not a thing you can do about it because you've just blocked their mu receptors. So you can't just suddenly give them more opioid to, and think that it will work. So it's very very uncomfortable for patients. It's distressing for staff as well. And it puts them in immediately, immediate withdrawal. So if you like your patients, um, remember this, this tip on giving them a, a, a tenth to a quarter of an amp of Narcan instead of a full amp if it's life threatening. All right, let's talk uh, some more about um, a different type of side effect of opioids. Uh, this man was admitted to the hospital with an ischemic leg and gangrene and required amputation. He complained of such severe pain that the attending escalated his opioids rapidly. So he got hydromorphone, first 0.5 milligrams, then one, then two milligrams over a six hour period. Initially there was relief and the PRN doses were being given about every two to four hours. On post-op day two, he was sleepy but arousable, irritable, and complained of severe pain all over. And with just minimal touching, he was practically jumping off the bed. 
and further IV opioids or dose increases did not seem to help relieve his pain. So what is the problem here? What is the diagnosis? All right, opioid-induced hyperalgesia, OIH. It's a paradoxical hypersensitivity to painful stimuli where escalating pain occurs despite escalating opioid doses in the absence of progressive pathology. And basically, it's from upregulated mu receptors, and people will exhibit skin hypersensitivity. Uh, you touch them, you barely touch them, and they say, ow, you know, I hurt all over. They're, they may be a little bit confused, irritable, sleep, uh, they're not sleeping well, they're restless. And this can occur as early as within hours to days of opioid administration. It can occur late, um, but it's more common uh, earlier on. It may last for days. And the main risk factors are rapid dose increases or giving high doses of opioids. The treatment is opioid rotation, dose reduction, or using adjunctive medications. Um, and then specifically, the NMDA blocking medications are very helpful. So methadone, ketamine, dextromethorphan, or non-opioids. Opioids near end of life. And this is important. So in the hospital, we have people who they're, they're not doing well, and eventually either they or their family decide, well, let's just make them comfortable. We don't want them to suffer. And so opioids are a cornerstone of end of life care. And next week I'll be talking about care of the dying patient. So we'll go into some more detail about the different comfort medications. Um, but it is important to know a few things. So, um, so here's a 92 year old woman admitted to the hospital with severe abdominal pain and encephalopathy due to bowel per perforation from underlying colon cancer. Patient and the family just want her to be comfortable and not suffer. So IV morphine is ordered. Initially two milligrams, but then she required four milligrams. Um, it's made available every one hour as needed. Five minutes after receiving the four milligram dose, the patient dies and the nurse calls you upset, says she killed the patient with the morphine. So did she kill the patient or not? And how can you educate her or help her understand that no, she did the right thing? And you will, I guarantee you will see this on the medicine boards, the hospice and palliative medicine boards as well. So there's an ethical principle that's involved here. And again, you will see this on the boards. Um, so this is the principle of double effect. Okay, Carol says the disease killed the patient. She made her final moments comfortable, double effect. You are right on. So do opioids hasten death? And this is a common misconception. The answer is no. And I've seen many times in my career where somebody looked absolutely terrible. They looked like they had, you know, they might die within the next hour. And we gave them some opioids and their color improved, their blood pressure and heart rate improved, and they actually lived and got discharged with hospice. So no, the medications when used appropriately in proportional doses uh, based on the degree of symptoms are used, uh, no, they don't hasten death. And, and most of the time they do the opposite. They help people live longer because they're living better. That's also a reason why people live longer in hospice. Uh, because they're more comfortable. Um, so this principle of double effect, you will see on the board, so I guarantee it. And basically it's based on the, the idea or the fear that giving opioids is going to cause somebody to stop breathing and die. Um, and I, I really cringe when I hear that because it makes it sound like you have a choice. We can either give you opioids and you can be comfortable and you'll die sooner, or we can withhold the opioids and you can be more awake and live longer, but more uncomfortably. And it, it, there's not, it's not a dichotomy like that. Um, it can be both and rather than either or. 
Uh, but just know that death after opioid administration, uh, which has given for pain or, or dyspnea relief, is due to the underlying disease and not due to the medication. Uh, the treatment purpose or the motivation, the intent, is to provide relief of suffering and symptoms, not to kill the patient. And we have an ethical duty to provide comfort. So double effect is where you have a benign intent and there's an adverse event um, that may be foreseen, but that's not the intended result. You're not trying to end their life. You're trying to control the symptoms and in the process, the patient dies. But um, technically they're dying from the underlying disease and you are just making them comfortable in the dying process. And so it's very important to help families understand this, to help nurses understand this as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, I've seen that um, Carol is saying that she's had family tell her that the nurse murdered the patient, but did it mercifully. Yeah, people need to know that comfort care is not murder, um, especially when the doses are used appropriately. So but we have an ethical duty to provide comfort at end of life. So near end of life, it is important to take into account some dose adjustments. So as people lose weight, often towards end of life, even within you know weeks or even sometimes months, people, the appetite goes down, they're not eating as much, they begin to lose weight, they begin to become cachectic and lose the subcutaneous adipose tissue, uh, losing body fat, their albumin drops, and so there's less protein binding of the medications. And a lot of times, um, the oral or sublingual route becomes more effective than the transdermal route. Um, on the other hand, if someone has a fever, then there's going to be enhanced absorption of the fentanyl patch from the skin because there's more blood flow to the skin. So that's another thing to consider. Uh, dysphagia often occurs near end of life. And so considering alternative routes of administration, IV. If they don't have an IV, you can give it sub-Q. Uh, they can give it sublingually, you know, sub, uh, obviously you can't crush a long acting opioid uh, like MS content or oxycontin um, because it becomes immediate release. Um, so if they have a peg tube, um, you either have to do a fentanyl patch if they have enough fat, or you could do methadone, which is intrinsically long acting and you can give it as an elixir or crush the pill and put it through a peg tube. Um, also rectal route, that's another option. Um, less desirable probably, but still possible. Uh, when people become dehydrated toward end of life or develop renal or hepatic failure, generally they need lower doses and less frequently. And then if they become oliguric or anuric, mainly use PRN short-acting medications rather than long-acting ones uh, to avoid medication buildup. And then specifically avoid codeine and tramadol in renal failure and avoid the extended release forms of a morphine or oxycodone. Alternatives to morphine, fentanyl really is the best, uh, but methadone can be used, buprenorphine can be used, and hydrocodone or hydromorphone are also alternatives, but again, lower doses and probably a little less often. So in summary, uh, we've addressed uh, pain assessment in hospitalized patients with altered mental status. We've looked at the management of refractory pain, including adjunctive medications, uh, and also the use of opioid drips. Uh, recognize and manage selected side effects, specifically opioid-induced constipation, respiratory depression, and hyperalgesia. And then discuss dose reductions in renal and liver failure or near end of life. Are there any questions? I just wanted to, can, can you hear me, Mike? We've yes. Been having, yeah, okay, we've been having some problems with our audio here. Um, I just want to reinforce what Carol noted. You know, you, you, your case showed that the nurse was concerned, but uh, most of those uh, double effect scenarios are what, uh, you know, come from concerned family members. And it just enhances the, uh, I mean, just, just, it reinforces the importance of communication about what we're doing, why, and what the expected outcomes are and the importance of conversations about prognosis when someone is uh, at the end of life. Um, and that helps to avoid some of those uh, 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 misinterpretations of what we're doing, why, and, 
and ultimately what happens. Yeah, yeah, anticipatory guidance and addressing their expectations and helping them understand that, you know, it's not the nurse or the doctors or the palliative care team that's quote unquote killing their patient. It's not the family that's quote unquote killing their patient. It's the disease. And we have an obligation to try to make sure that their last hours or days are comfortable. And we have lots of tools available to do that. Right. Well, thanks, Mike. I uh, appreciate you uh, uh, presenting this this morning. Uh, this is the last week in which we do not have a case presentation. They, those will start uh, next week. And so we'll make sure we get out to the, to, to, to the fellows uh, that uh, whoever's in charge of uh, presenting the case next week. Uh, I don't have that in front of me immediately, but we'll get that, we'll get that to you. Um, and look forward to seeing you all again next week. Thanks again, Mike. Everyone right, have a good thank day. You. Have Bye -bye. a good day.